interest of time, we should get started. Um, I'm Peter Andreas here from the Watson Institute in the Political Science Department, and I uh, organize the Global Security Seminar Series here at the Institute, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Paul Gutenberg back to the Watson Institute. I think it's been about three or four years since we had him here for a conference sponsored by CLAX. Um, how do I I'm going to keep this short, but it'll be glowing. Um, Paul, in my view, is um, one of the world's two or three leading historians of drugs. And on the specific drug of cocaine, it's fair to say he's the world's leading historian. So this is, you know, world's, you know, Guinness Book of World Records guy here. You know, he's the top of the, ch of the chain in cocaine academia. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, his most well-known book in this regard is Andy and Cocaine. It uh, came out uh, a few years ago. It's a terrific read. It's sort of the definitive history of this title of the book, Andy and Cocaine. Um, his talk today um, is called Blowback, great title, and it traces cocaine chains uh, from the early uh, 20th century um, to the present. And since he's a historian, He's a little old-fashioned as well, so as you know, he's handed out a, a handout for you all to have. Remember those? No PowerPoint. Very no inefficient, anything, just, wasteful you know, 20th century. Uh, technology. A handout. So I haven't had one of these in a long Wait, time. Have, there's more. <laughs> there's I have more. these things called maps <laughs> right. as well, if you feel like you need one. All right. So thank you, Paul. Um, I think I said he's a distinguished professor of history at uh, Stony Brook, so it's a quick trip up from New York. We're, we're thrilled to have him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, I don't know if I can really live up to that dubious distinction, but I'll take it. World's most distinguished professor of cocaine studies or whatever. Um, anyway, it is actually, um, I did want to mention that it's only apt that I'd be speaking here today the day after the Oscars, because of course, according to Hollywood lore, half of L.A. is in some kind of cocaine hangover as we speak. Um, but if you bear with me through my talk here today, um, I think I'm going to try to take you to a, a totally different kind of cocaine hangover, so to speak, which is the kind that is possibly happening uh, to the long U.S. hemispheric war on drugs as the American romance um, with cocaine and ties to South American cocaine seem to be fading or might fade in the next couple of years. Now, I'm going to come to this, I think Peter has already given my caveat, with one caveat, which is I don't really think of myself much as a kind of a security or an IR or conflict kind of guy, but rather a simple historian of commodities mainly with an avid interest in drugs and as um, uh, Peter um, intimated, um, even a strong interest in the predicaments we have with drugs today. But I have noticed in recent years, and I've told Peter about this, that I've been oddly invited, it's, it's pretty strange for a historian, to address some pretty surprising audiences. Not this one, but places like the President's Drug Czar's office, the DEA, um, the CIA, um, and U.S. Army Southcom, um, groups that all seem to be a bit worried these days that they're losing the so-called war on drugs, and who certainly, in my estimation, are losing um, expert or public opinion about the feasibility of that conflict. So maybe with that in mind, uh, that can be part of the um, framing of today's talk today, um, which is, as I take you through this long-term history of cocaine and the United States, we could look at the ways in which a kind of a metaphoric idea of the war on drugs transformed over time into a real conflict, a real war in the Western Hemisphere, a bloody war in the next in the Western Hemisphere, filled with, uh, I'm going to explain this in a second, pitfalls of political and other forms of blowback, 
Um, but, and this is the important but, if I hope I'm not losing you at this point, but after about 2005 or so, things have begun to move into a new direction, not just with cocaine, but with hemispheric drug policies. And we might be, possibly because of this, which I also consider to be a form of long-term blowback, might be morphing into a de-escalation of that war, or maybe it's transformation um, by hook or crook into more peaceful forms of coexistence with illicit drugs like cocaine. But that's, that's a big thought uh, that I hope to be able to get you to through this history. Now, the way to get there, um, and that's where the handouts and maybe even the maps, if you'd like a map, I have these cool mid-century maps, you know, like Eames era maps um, that um, they were put out by the UN. Um, so basically what I want to do here today is very quickly spend half the time going over this long-term history of cocaine and the blowback effect, um, a kind of panoramic view of cocaine's stages as it emerged into an illicit, menacing drug in the Western Hemisphere between about 1900 and 2000. And then I want to switch gears and I want to kind of look at what's happening today in the 21st century and speculate as to whether these big structural changes in the global cocaine situation could possibly be one of the factors behind what may shift global drug politics, or at least hemispheric drug war in the next couple of decades, hopefully in a, uh, if I may take size, better direction than it's had in the past. Okay, anyway, let me just preface this by throwing out two concepts, which I'm sure for an academic audience are not going to be difficult ones that I use um, a lot in this type of talk. The first thing is I'm probably talk a little bit as I go along here about global commodity chains, which I'm sure almost everyone's heard of, a concept that's lifted from economic sociology, and it's the way um, a lot of sociologists and other academics as well look at the kind of long um, interconnected trail of particular goods, how suppliers and intermediaries and consumers are connected, and not just um, commercially, but also by law, by power, by all kinds of cultural flows and influences. And so I use the commodity chain concept a lot to look at how these changes have shaped um, the trajectory of even an illicit drug like cocaine. The second concept which I'll throw out, and it's rather broad, it's kind of a catch-all for me, is I'm going to use the term blowback. Um, uh, and blowback, of course, for many of you, now there's a term that maybe security people would know about because um, it, apparently if the origins of the term was from intelligence agencies that used to secretly talk about, oh, what's, we can do this, but what's the blowback going to be? Oh, yeah, well, we might have, you know, 10,000, you know, casualties, but we can hush that up, you know. So unintended consequences of a social or political action. But here I want to talk about blowback as the whole conjury of unintended impacts of drug policy or drug intervention, which includes a whole litany of things together, the so-called balloon effect or ge geography, the perverse price effects that raise the incentive to produce illicit drugs, Darwinian effects where our policies actually make drug traffickers better over the long term rather than making them worse at what they do. Um, cockroach effect where scattering the geographies of traffickers. And even in this catch-all, all kinds of unforeseen um, political effects of drug wars and uh, drug prohibition policies that no one would have thought about or very few would have listened to um, when we got engaged in these policies, especially full throttle after the 1980s. Stop me if you think I'm going too fast here, but um, 
So I'm going to just throw out these concepts as we go through the stages of cocaine's history. And then from there, we'll move to talking about cocaine's interesting dynamic present that opens up these new possibilities. OK, so this is your handout. Um, I have to admit, I've never actually learned to use PowerPoint, which um, it's how, um, this is so much better. It's so much more tactile, right? Clear to the eyes. And it always works, as opposed to PowerPoint, which almost never works. OK, so if you look quickly at this chart, the, the first stage, which is an interesting starting point, and I've always used this in my work on cocaine, is the period from the 1900s to the 1940s when there actually was a legal cocaine industry in the Western Hemisphere, which is, uh, Peter knows, I studied in depth in my book, Andy and Cocaine. Cocaine was a, a modern medical drug, a revolutionary anesthesia, anesthesia when it was uh, first uh, uh, isolated in the late 19th century. Cocaine production concentrated at first in these outbacks of eastern Peru. Um, and they built up this medicinal cocaine industry, peaked around 1905 at about 10 tons that they um, shipped to Europe and to the United States. But to, in, I'm going to make this long story short, but between about 1915 and 1945, the United States and a few other international powers, but mostly the United States, began to a push to restrict and ban cocaine internationally. The industry declined drastically in Peru. Um, by the end of World War II, they were perhaps making about a half a ton of cocaine still legally at the end of World War II. But what was important was that the, these outback Peruvians still had this know-how, this technology how to make um, what we would call today PVC, or pasta basica de cocaína. They knew how to take the coca leaf and concentrate it and make it into a semi-drug <clears throat> form. Okay? And they were practically the only people in the world who knew anything about this in the middle of the 20th century. The main thing to note, though, when thinking about legal cocaine and its decline is that if you looked at this area, in the late 1940s, um, you would have seen cocaine, if you saw it at all, you would have thought, that's a very marginal thing. Um, there was no illicit cocaine at all. I looked and looked. I never found any evidence of that. And it was peaceful. No one was getting killed over this marginal illicit commodity, or illicit commodity. So that was the baseline for everything that was to, going to happen later in the history of cocaine, which was going to be a big deal, as most of you know, just from your you know, even pop knowledge of, of recent history. The second stage here, I don't want to get mixed up, but I want to keep to my chart here, from 1948 to 1973 is the era when illicit cocaine is created and the first networks of the drug begin to move north. Uh, again, it's a long story, but after World War II, there's a big push, particularly by the United States, to uniform uh, drug laws across the globe. And cocaine is kind of targeted. Let's get rid of cocaine. It's criminalized in places like Peru. And you begin to see the first illicit actors emerge in the 1950s and 1960s, scattered, um, pretty petty, first in Peru, then in Bolivia during the 1950s. It transits, beginning to find its transit ways north, small smugglers through Cuba. Havana is a big cocaine test market area. And surprisingly, most people don't know this unless they watch Netflix now, which has stolen my thunder. Chile. Um, um, there is, parenthetically, I think somebody at Netflix read my book because um, they never gave me any residuals or anything like that, but I don't care. All publicity is good publicity. Um, the turning point in this is 1916. The turning point, like a lot of things in Cold War Latin America, is the Cuban Revolution. 
So Cuba had been incubating this, this class of kind of gangsters who were making more and more money off of cocaine. Well, they get expelled across the Western Hemisphere from Argentina to Mexico to Miami. Um, and what that makes, in my estimation, was this new thing, a trans-American or tr hemisphere trafficking class for the first time. And by 1970, you have this bustling, what I would really call a commodity chain of cocaine, um, which means that it's connecting peasants who are emerging as coca growers and illicit cocaine makers in the eastern Andes in Peru and Bolivia, it connects them to these traffickers in the middle, and then to these uh, beginning cocaine scenes and markets in places like New York and Miami um, and even a little bit on the West Coast. Now, main, most of this was still being funneled through Chile, um, it was going from Bolivia to the north of Chile and out. Um, it was still kind of small, who knows, we can't really measure it, a few tons of cocaine were going out overall, and it was still pretty peaceful. Um, and arguably, and getting back to this concept, the reason for this illicit cocaine, though there may have been other things at work, was blowback. Once we had criminalized cocaine in the Andes, the incentive had emerged and sh shown up over this two-decade period for people to get involved with creating an illicit drug, and they had by 1970. Okay, so by then, there is this thing called illicit cocaine. A few tons, fairly peaceful enterprise still. The third stage here, and I want to kind of move through a lot of this stuff quickly because I want to get to the present, um, is 1973 to 1980s. And this is the period where cocaine shifts to Colombia and to its boom as a wholesale illicit drug. Most people don't know this, but Colombia got pretty late into the business of cocaine or smuggling of drugs. There were two events that had a big impact on this, um, and they were both kind of blowback type of events, if you think about them in larger perspective. The first one was the Pinochet coup in Chile in 1973, and G General Pinochet, in order to impress uh, the U.S. government, um, said, well, I'll get rid of these cocaine dealers for you. And he went about stamping out the cocaine trade, which was pretty localized in Chile. And that was it. He did a good job of that in Chile. If they all went to Colombia, or the whole trade shifted very quickly to Colombia. And within a couple of years, Colombians had taken charge. They had a good location for doing that. And um, the DEA was like, oh my god, what have we done? Um, apparently some, I know this historian had talked to some DEA agents about this and they said that was one of the biggest mistakes we ever did was encouraging Pinochet to crack down. The DEA had just been formed that year, if you, any of you know, uh, and this was one of their first operations was let's get this guy to crack down on cocaine. So the second thing that did a job of consolidating cocaine in and definitely was a blowback event was Nixon's war on drugs. He declares the war on drugs. He focuses it against um, uh, three drugs, in particular marijuana, just because he hated students so much. Um, well, I think it's a, good, it's a good enough explanation as any, right? Um, Heroin, the French connection, was beginning to get bad press. It was synonymous with crime in the inner city, you know, and he was tough on crime. And amphetamine, speed, um, which was just becoming illegal in the United States. So Nixon declares this war on drugs, and the French connection in particular dampened heroin supplies in the United States. You might see a huge cycle because we're back, cocaine down, heroin up, um, going on here. And what this does is cocaine was almost completely unknown in the United States, but it comes onto the market very quickly in the early 70s as a glamour drug, as a soft drug. It was expensive and as a safe drug. You know, like uh, heroin, bad needles, cocaine, good. You just blow it in your nose. Rock stars, Hollywood, everyone's using it who's got money. Um, you know, all the cocaine jokes in the world came out of this 1970s ballooning of cocaine. 
And literally, some of these dealers switched off from dealing in Mexican or Colombian marijuana to, oh, here we can make a lot more money in a more concentrated drug, um, more profitable drug, cocaine, this new thing coming onto the market, than we could in that smelly marijuana that was easily caught in the 60s, okay? So the blowback of the war on drugs is um, the expansion, the billowing of cocaine that occurs during the 1970s. And in a period where if you go deep into the period, really nobody really understood what was going on. Um, and there wasn't that much of a crackdown on cocaine for the next 10 years or so. So it multiplies by about 10 times to the best of our knowledge. During the 1970s, the, the commodity chain is consolidated from the Eastern Andes. The peasants are busy in the Huayaga Valley or in parts of Bolivia creating all that cocaine paste. And um, they're giving it to these Colombians who are getting richer and richer. And the Colombians are wholesaling it and building more and more larger organizations, which later get denominated, for better or for worse, probably for worse, as cartels, because they were actually highly capitalistic regional organizations, not a cartel in the literary, literal sense of the term, and bring into their corridor in South Florida. That was their big runway into the United States. Um, and even, you know, some of you may know, buying up islands in the Caribbean to facilitate their runway into the United States. So it was just going across the Caribbean into the U.S. markets, which were expanding by leaps and bounds. Um, so the stakes are rising now. There's a lot of money getting invested in this drug cocaine. Um, and since it's a high-priced commodity, this is when you begin to first see the first inklings of the violence around cocaine, which was non-existent before the 1970s. So this is the era that those of you who watch TV religiously, I hope so, um, this is the so-called Miami Vice era. Um, now that's a show that really hasn't, I would say, has lost its glamour when you watch that. The movie remake wasn't so bad, but the original show, the fascination with that, you had to be there. Cocaine cowboys, they were sometimes called. So a lot of violence and turf wars are beginning between these different gangs, the Colombians, the Cubans, and other um, gangs who are trying to consolidate and spread their markets throughout the United States. And the United States is the major market for this drug. Those smaller subsidiary markets are growing up in other parts of the world. So let's go quickly the fourth stage here. I didn't give them numbers. And that's the late 1980s to the 1990s, you know, maybe even 2000. And this is the US war on Andean cocaine and the Caribbean corridor. Um, so you saw there was a lot of blowback in that stage, too. But wait till we declare an open war on cocaine. In the early 1980s, Reagan is elected. Um, cocaine and drugs in general are declared a national security threat. There's a tremendous amount of hysteria that emerges in the United States, particularly after 1985 around the so-called crack epidemic in the United States, where the retailing of cocaine to lower income groups um, spread very rapidly. The price of cocaine was going down so quickly that new markets were opening up, and crack was one of them. So this is the period where the US war on drugs is actually being, being implemented. Before, it was more rhetorical in the, from the 70s. By the 80s, it was being made into a real military apparatus. It was getting new legislation. It was getting new Pentagon, Southcom um, type. Peter has written a lot about this. Southcom type of armaments, alliances, or with would-be Andean states who are hard allies to, to um, 
pinned down, and you begin to see the spiraling of violence around the drug in all areas of the, I don't want to get too much into this era, but in the Wyoga Valley there's violence linked to guerrillas, in the Colombian cities by the mid-80s a civil war is broken out between the drug organizations and the Colombian state that lasts at least a decade, it is Byzantine in its implications, and the violence in U.S. cities at the street level where crack has become the predominant, one of the predominant areas of market expansion of the, of the drug. So um, in, by the late 1980s, the United States begins to focus on Colombia, the extradition policies, militarizing the Colombian state, um, Medellin is the world murder capital, and it will be for quite a while until even after the assassination of Escobar in 1993. Other fronts of this war include the Peru's Wyaga Valley, where finally in the early 1990s, um, the United States convinces the dictator there, Fujimori, to close um, of coca paste that's feeding the Colombian cartels, and they, they shoot down airplanes, and that tends to be a pretty um, effective um, um, a tool against uh, the cocaine industry of the Eastern Andes. Um, all kinds of sophisticated radar and ships. President, Vice President Bush, senior, is brought in to head up this Operation Swordfish, and there's a lot of other names that are given to these, like integrated Navy, Army, DEA operations that are going to close down the Caribbean as this open cocaine shipping lane mart into the United States. So. What happens? The upshot of this militarization of the drug war in the 1980s. The upshot is it does not break cocaine. Um, what it does is it leads to the vertical integration of cocaine. And what do I mean by that? The Colombians go, wow, this is really profitable. Um, the price keeps rising, all this risk interdiction. Um, let's just seed more. Hey, why don't we grow the coca? And suddenly, within less than a decade, Colombia goes from being a country that didn't have any coca to being one where the coca is grown there. Even poppy began to be grown in Colombia. And they verticalized and nationalized the drug industry. And by the mid-1990s, there's more cocaine than there's ever been in the world. About, it peaks about 1,400 tons. If you think about it, if you go back, I used to play with these numbers all the time. It's a little facetious. That's um, 140 times the peak of the legal cocaine industry in 1905 and uh, 280 times what the amount of cocaine that was produced when it was a marginal legal drug after World War II. That was the impact of the drug war, um, to increase the supply of cocaine hundreds of times. Um, with major impacts. Also, the United States and the Colombian government adopted this kingpin strategy. We'll extradite, we'll assassinate, we'll target these big guys down there. The ones with the big names, the ones that are trying to influence politics like Escobar and the Medellin and the Cali and all those other cartels. And what was the impact of that? The impact of that was just to make <laughs> drug organizations more efficient, smaller, more elusive, um, better at hiding their shipments, and it's been documented that by the end of the 1990s, now instead of these few cartels, there were like 600 small boutique cartels in Colombia. Now there are even more. They're called, they just have another name. So it just splintered, but made them actually better at doing their job, which was illicit smuggling and act activities. Um, Okay, finally, um, because I do want to move more to the present, I just want to talk about one more stage that was significant in the evolution of cocaine. And that is um, that mid-1990s to about the present, the shift to Mexico and border drug violence. Because if you thought things were bad then in Colombia, which went through this horrific violence, it wasn't just about drugs because it began to fuel all kinds of guerrilla and para 
military um, violence as well. Um, the country spirals into another type of civil war in the late 1990s. But what happened with the U.S. policy of cutting off at the source, the interdiction policy across the Caribbean? Well, what it did is it shifted very quickly by 1990s, early 1990s, the locus of the commodity chain of cocaine. Some of it shifted to Cali, and Cali was better equipped through Pacific ports to begin marketing cocaine up the west coast of South America, Central America. Um, this is the unstable period of civil wars and revolutions in Central America. And there they began to partner with these guys in places like Sinaloa and Juarez. And these Mexican traffickers who had already been around, something happens with cocaine. They had never <coughs> dealt with the billions of dollars that was latent in cocaine that they were going to get this chance for in the 1990s. And very quickly, these groups emerged, the so-called Juarez cartel, the Sinaloan group as well, that they become, they edge out the Colombians, they edge out the people who were originally the ones to um, supply the cocaine, and they gain, for the first time ever, so much money, so much power and influence, that they break the equilibrium that they always had with the Mexican state. And most of you are somehow familiar with this, that something is brewing in Mexico in the 1990s, where these criminal groups who are, who are uh, retailing, not retailing, but distributing cocaine across the border to the United States are gaining so much power that they, they've gained the edge politically and economically in Mexico. Most of this was because of cocaine. They've always dealt in a few other drugs, but nothing had the billions of dollars and ready cash and profits that cocaine did. And here in the United States, thinking, oh, we've made this great strategic move of cutting off the Caribbean and South Florida, they had the blowback of now having to deal with this practically intractable problem of the Mexican border, the world's longest contiguous land border, geographically, politically, socially complex, growing, galloping population zone, one of the world's fastest growing commercial zones because of NAFTA. So basically a mess was created with the shifting of cocaine to northern Mexican land and sea routes. So by 2000, the, the situation was, was quite volatile along the Mexican border. Now, I'm not going to go deeply into this, but I think that this is the background, really, to what began to later after 2007 be known as the Mexican Drug War. Most of you are familiar with that. Um, the Pond Party and President uh, Calderon in particular decided we've had enough of this or we're going to make our political mark here and we're going to wipe out these big um, drug organizations in the north of Mexico. And uh, I dare say the main impact of that has been uh, just a lot of dead people along the north of, of Mexico, uh, you know, estimates uh, in those years alone range from 60 to 70,000. Uh, it's a notorious epic. So you see that if you look at it in this kind of locational aspect, just to get the big picture here, cocaine went from being a relatively peaceful drug way far away in some remote back part of the Amazon that nobody cared about whatsoever to being a drug that was getting closer and closer to the borders of the United States and wrecking ever more mayhem and murder than had ever been seen associated with an illicit drug. Okay, so I won't. I mean, we could get into some aspects of the Mexican drug war later, but I, 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 I kind of um, want to get to what's been happening in in recent years. There's been some changes in Mexico. They're not exactly what the government claims. Um, violence and Drugs are flowing in different directions within Mexico. Um, yes, it's it's more peaceful in Juarez, but 
um, it's hard to say that it was really the government policies that made it that way. In many ways, they repeated exactly the same error that was repeated in Colombia in the 1980s and 1990s of trying to get these kingpins, which is only a formula for uh, uh, really exacerbating the instability and violence of drug tra training organizations. Okay. So I'm going to turn a little here because I feel like I've gone on a lot more with the history. And I want to talk about today. Because surprisingly, this was the background to thinking about the long-term commodity chains. A number of people are beginning to notice that there are some big changes afoot in the world of cocaine. Um, and I want to give you an idea of this um, because they're worth thinking about in terms of them as blowback effects, first of all, but also the ways that they may be changing, going back to the theme I told you about at the beginning, the contours of the war on drugs. Because cocaine, from a United States perspective, is actually beginning to recede. In fact, in some ways, quite dramatically. And I want to argue that if this continues, it could be reversed like, you know, we're always having a changing menu of drugs in the United States. It could be reversed, but if it continues in this direction, um, it could really undercut what has been for the past 40 years the mainstay of the U.S. war on drugs, which was this alliance of the United States and Colombia in fighting cocaine, okay? Now, my main view of what's happening with cocaine, and I'll get into some of the specifics of it in a second, is that that big commodity chain of cocaine is shifting. The same amount of cocaine, more or less, is still being produced, maybe a little bit less. Maybe instead of 1,400 tons, 800 to 1,200 tons a year are being produced. But instead of it coming to the United States, which was the traditional driving market of the co cocaine commodity chain, it's globalizing. It's globalizing throughout South America, it's globalizing to Europe, and it's probably globalizing to Asia. And it's probably, this globalization of cocaine is probably a byproduct or blowback effect of the hardline drug policies of the United States and the Mexican drug war. Um, it's hard to say exactly, um, but the future of cocaine looks very different, and that raises different political possibilities in the war on drugs. First of all, let me just go down this as quickly as possible, because I do want to discuss this. Too much in the history. Anyway, let's just talk about the consumption of cocaine. Um, a few years ago, a group of social scientists uh, began to notice that, uh, oh my gosh, what's going on with cocaine? Um, cocaine consumption in the United States began to fall quite dramatically. It had been kind of on the decline since the late 90s, probably the peak. These things are really hard, actually, to... The consumption of drugs is actually a very hard thing for the government to know. But after 2007 or so, there began to be perceptible declines in cocaine in the United States. And something else, for the first time ever, a rise in its price. That's odd, because that was the whole purpose of the war on drugs. It took 40 years for that to happen. Um, and so basically, to give you some numbers about this, um, in the United States, we went from having as many as 7 million hardcore drug cocaine users or not hardcore, but regular cocaine users, um, to, at the moment, probably less than 2 million regular cocaine users in the United States. I'm trying to look here for some of my statistics right here. But probably um, US drug consumption went from over 300 um, tons in 2000 to less than half of that today, OK? So cocaine is declining in the United States. Now, you're probably going to go, well, that's might, if, even if that's true, we've got a lot more heroin go going on in the United States, and that's absolutely true. The menu of drugs has just kind of shifted. Whether or not it's the same people or same vulnerable populations, I, I doubt it. But 
But now we're facing a crisis with heroin, and the United States is also moving in a more positive light to becoming a pot nation, um, where the, the um, uh, consumption of pot in the United States is really way off the charts. We've never had anything like this before. But in my modest view, that is a big public health gain over drugs like cocaine, which used to dominate in the past, or even alcohol. Um, and even there's even political effects of this. I found this thing sitting out there on the internet the other day, a couple months ago, actually. The, the DEA puts out these things called the National Drug Threat Assessment. Um, and it's shocking, the National Drug Threat Assessment. What they do is that they do a good um, survey of hundreds of police chiefs or departments around the country. They say, what is the biggest drug threat that you're facing? And even to 2010, I believe it was, like 40% said cocaine. They've been trained to think cocaine, 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 cocaine. Guess what it is now? Cocaine is like 5% of police departments think that this is a drug threat. The 40% or more, always heroin now. It's completely flipped. And the, and the good news in this is also that nobody seems to think marijuana is a problem. That's also like 5 or 10%. So even though marijuana is way up in the United States, it's not being taken as a security threat. And neither is cocaine. That's interesting. That opens up all kinds of possibilities. So where is this cocaine going that's still being produced in the Andean region? A lot is going to Europe. The big cocaine per capita, that is over 1% of adult population, regular users are UK, Spain, Italy. And then, surprisingly, the, but it's been around for a long time, Brazil. Brazil is either the second or first largest cocaine-consuming nation in the world. I don't want to get deeply into this, but this could have been a blowback effect. Because as we um, pressured onto Colombia in the 1990s, a lot of these Colombian traffickers started rerouting their cocaine through Brazil and onto West Africa and onto Europe. And Brazilians caught this, like, you know, kind of enthusiasm for the drug. And it's a big, big party drug in Brazil today. And also, Brazil is suffering almost in a replication of our historical cracolangias, very racialized cocaine scenes among um, poor, um, uh, they're not minorities, in, in poor majorities in uh, Afro descendants in Brazil. So, um, another, Argentina, Chile, also very high rates of use. And probably the future direction that we just don't know much about at this point, Australia is big, um, always party-loving people out there. Um, and uh, China is probably the next big thing. You know, once they get over this little bump on their road to um, capitalism, um, people are going to want to party more with cocaine. So. Um, uh, one could say that the successes, if that's what it was, because it's highly debatable what really was, uh, with the U.S. interdiction and repression policies like Plan Colombia, the blowback of that is this highly globalized drug, a, a commodity chain which literally is going to the south rather than the north, okay? Literally going from, and I'll get to this in a second, Peru through Brazil and Argentina, rather than Colombia north to the United States, or what's left of Colombia moving through Venezuela and Brazil um, to Europe. So the same thing is going on with trafficking. Um, we're seeing a lot of shifts. Even in Mexico, organizations are moving south from the border, uh, where um, that war seems to be. They're splitting. They're spreading. They're spreading to South America. They're spreading. Transnationally, Sinaloans are in Argentina, are in eastern Peru. Um, Colombia um, is a whole other um, uh, question, what's really going on in Colombia. There seems to have been some threshold of Colombia crackdown uh, mm -hmm. after years and years and years on drug trade organizations. Uh, and cocoleros that after 2007, coca and cocaine began to um, decrease um, a great deal in the country, 50%. But last year, it went up again. 
And there's a lot of debate as to what that means, the resurgence of coca and cocaine. The biggest victims in the, in, so, so far in, in the pressures of the drug war are the countries of Central America and, uh, and uh, Guatemala are um, suffering a great deal of this explosion of gang violence. Not all of it is connected directly to cocaine. There are other issues that are involved, but cocaine and the coming in of, of trafficking groups from Mexico is exacerbating very fragile situations there and has gotten the U.S. and U.S. military quite worried that here finally are the prospect of failed states that could become narco states in um, the foreseeable future. So these weak and poor states seem to be the ones that are picking up um, the blowback of trafficking organizations that are fleeing from places like northern Mexico and um, Colombia. Now, the sourcing is also interesting, and I don't want to get too much into this, but um, here's where you see the, the cocaine commodity chains changing. It's been ping-ponging back and forth across the eastern Andes for the past 40 years. Um, and what's happened since coca has begun to decline, let's say it's a secular trend in Colombia, it could be, because with the FARC Treaty this month, that could consolidate in a new way um, Colombia's efforts to finally stymie the um, rebirth of the coca and cocaine trade in the country. But what's happened? What's happened is that the Vrem, which is the valley of the river of the of Purimac and Ene and Montaro, well, anyway, it's just another one of these big, um, remote, and poor Andean Amazon regions has really turned out to be the big cocaine region of the last five years, okay? Something like 30 to 40% of the cocaine produced in the world now is coming from eastern Peru. The UN in 2013 said Peru is the number one cocaine country in the world. It's back again, so it kind of went back and forth between Peru and Colombia and back again. And in Peru's case, one of the big problems is that unlike Colombia, where the Colombian military and police got pretty good at interdiction and finding out where cocaine was, and they catch an awful lot of it, that seems to be a good policy. In Peru, they don't catch any of it, or so little of it, it doesn't make any difference. So when they say that Peru's illicit cocaine capacity is 300 tons a year, they mean 300 tons a year, <laughs> because almost all of it gets abroad. Whereas when they say that Colombia's cocaine capacity is 300 tons a year, they're talking about 100 tons that get out of the country and into the global markets. So it's a shift in the commodity chain towards the south, across to Brazil, across to Argentina. Um, if this trend continues, there'll be less and less of it coming directly to the United States and more and more of it going to South America, to Europe, and who knows what other parts of the world. And I did have in one of these interesting um, meetings that I had by DEA, blah, 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 they were like very quizzical to me as if I had the secret. Um, like, where's all this Peruvian cocaine going? We haven't found any of it in the United States. And I tried to explain to them, well, I could speculate and say, you know, it's being globalized in ways you don't know yet. Um, but I don't really know myself. I don't have it in my briefcase, for sure. Um, but they didn't know at that point. They may know now more, but they have these very sophisticated cocaine tracking um, that they use DNA, uh, not DNA, but um, I forget what it's called, but it's like a, uh, they can do spectral analysis of, of all the chemical composition. They can say, this is good, um, cauca cocaine. And this is good, and they, they, they rely on these high-tech um, sourcing things, and they hadn't been able to find out where all this proving cocaine was going. Anyway, let me just end on one small thing, which is the blowback political effects. In the past 50 years, the war on drugs relied on the compliance of Latin American states. They became our allies. Some of them were a little bit corrupt, and some of them were foot-dragging a lot. And... Um, 
some of it had to do with the Cold War, the and so you know, still ending today in places like Cuba and Colombia, if you think about it. Um, and, but at the same time that the war on drugs relied on the compliance of Latin American states and elites who were afraid of instability, the costs of that war on drugs were oftentimes sort of kept across the border. So it was places like Colombia that lost people, environments, the costs of running these wars, the social disruption. They were the ones who felt the impact in a more direct sense, took the costs of our um, drug war, even if they were sharing on, in, in part on this. Um, so here's what I'm trying to speculate about these days when I think about cocaine, is that if there really is this shift that's going to continue towards the South, away from the United States, what's going to happen to the basis of the drug war, which was so much based on cocaine in the United States, the hyper-profits of cocaine and keeping cocaine out of the United States, and these alliances with frontline states like um, Colombia, um, Forget Bolivia, because they defected a long time ago. Now, some of you may know that since about 2005, there's been this surprising development in Latin America. Um, and the surprising development is quite suddenly, almost out of nowhere, it seems to have taken most observers, a, a series of Latin American states have become outspoken opponents or dissenters in the drug war. It started around 2008 when there was this commission of, of Latin American notables who said, can't there be another way? Um, this is very hurtful to our region. It undermines democracy. In 2012, the OAS held this big summit to discuss the issue, and they put out this incredibly well-founded big report which, which contested the United States drug war, said we need a public health approach to this, we need to be able to experiment with other strategies. And this has continued. In 2015, Colombia stopped fumigating. Um, and Colombia and a number of other Latin American states have really been the strongest opponents of the US agenda at the, have any of you ever heard of the UNGAS, the, upcoming meeting, it's coming up in two months of the UN General Assembly, to debate the international drug regime. Should it continue to be a strictly prohibitionist regime, or should it open up to new views? Latin America has emerged, not all of Latin America, but a number of states have emerged as the leaders of this international movement. And it probably won't succeed, but it's really interesting. And I've been trying to puzzle out through my mind why is this happening? And there's lots of explanations. These countries are much more sovereign than they used to be. They watched what happened in Mexico, the country just destroyed by joining in with the US drug war. But I also think it's got something to do with this shifting of the, of the they may not realize it in these terms, but the shifting of the commodity chain south where it becomes much more a question, a problem of these South-South countries. For example, the role of Brazil and Argentina, for better or for worse, in controlling drugs in South America is probably going to be on the rise. Anyway, the point that I really wanted to make here, I don't want to speculate all over the place, is that this dissent of the U.S. drug war, where the Latin American states are the ones to say, particularly a militant state like Colombia, say, no, no, we don't want to do this anymore. We've got to find a better solution than just pouring more military um, and repressive strategies into this. What's going to actually work? What's actually going to get bring the level of violence down? What's actually going to bring development to peasants? This, in its own way, is a kind of political blowback after having a half century of this drug war where the front lines and where most of the damage was inflicted in South America, the Andean countries, Mexico, and now Central America, the blowback is this diversification of Latin American opinion, saying, wait a minute, we don't know if we want to continue doing this anymore. You guys aren't giving us any good answers up there in the United States. You're so ideological up there in the United States about drugs. Why don't you become pragmatic 
the way we are down here in Latin America and think of new ways to approach this. And so that's what I meant at the very beginning, that blowback can be a very, very big concept. So I think I'll end here to see if you have any reactions to my rambling of, I hope I didn't go on too long here, um, um, of about 100 years of commodity chains and drug war and blowback and see if this all makes any sense to you. So. We have about a half hour for some questions and we can feel what we're talking about. Oh, Peter, you have a question. <laughs> yes. Um, great talk. Um, you mentioned in the middle of your talk that the Cuban Revolution was this watershed event uh, in the Americas. We can all agree on that, but it wasn't clear to me how you tied that into the cocaine story. You said something about you know, the scattering of criminals and mafiosos, but can you be able to put a little more meat on it, a little more detail oh, sure. on it in terms of how that was crucial in the cocaine trade itself? Another way of asking the question is, counterfactually, if you take out the Cuban Revolution, how does your story actually change or not? I've never thought about it in that latter sense, but I'll tell you what I, what I have, uh, hmm. but I will try to think about that. Um, first of all, Cuba was emerging in the 1950s. Probably some of you have this image of 50s Cuba, casinos, Batista, corruption, Sin City, uh, tourism. And in fact, with drugs, it was pretty clear that Cuba was becoming the hub of cocaine in the Americas, okay? It was being produced in Bolivia, for the most part at this point, in the 50s. And it was either being taken by Chileans or Cubans who were beginning to fly into Bolivia, pick up the drug, and they were using their casinos and sex clubs and music clubs and whatnot to use this new drug. Um, there wasn't that much heroin in Cuba. Um, and, but so the drug was a party drug in Cuba that was being Latin elites. You know, it wasn't just US tourists who went to Cuba. There were Mexicans, Brazilians, people from all over the hemisphere. Havana was like the capital of, of kind of offshore Sin City. And what I found, and there's a, actually a historian wrote an entire, there's been a couple of books about this, some of them are somewhat exaggerated, is that the Cuban mafia, not the international mafia, interestingly enough, because there were plenty of Meyer Lanskys and these people in Cuba, but they kind of stayed out of the drug thing. The Cuban Mafia was becoming greatly involved with cocaine. Um, of course, it was an illicit activity. You can't say to what extent um, this was, but when you look at the rap sheets and whatnot, almost all the big dealers of the late 50s, early 60s are Cubans, okay? So what happens with the revolution? One of the first things that Fidel, if we're gonna be on a first name basis, with him does is he can't stand these capitalist gangsters and the expulsion of the gangster class is one of the most dramatic early things that happens in the Cuban Revolution. And so like other diasporas, one of the best things that you can do as a diaspora is to have some particular type of trade that you can put in your pocket, you know, like diamonds or cocaine or something like that. And so they bring their, ex they scatter throughout Latin America and then when you see the FBN's first early 60s listing of who are the top cocaine dealers in, La in Latin America, they're all these Cubans. They're all the Cubans that are in Argentina, in <clears throat> Bolivia, in Miami, in Mexico, in Guatemala. And in my mind, as I think I said in the talk, they become, for the first time, a professional trafficking class. And by that I mean this is what they do for a living. They want to invest more in cocaine. It's highly profitable. They want peasants to produce more coca paste. So they're invested in the expansion of this commodity chain. And so it was quite, uh, I wouldn't call it ethnically, but it was very much linked to this 
national right-wing diaspora from Cuba into the United States. And of course, they're getting preferential treatment from the United States throughout the 1960s. So it's kind of going under the radar through the other. So that's the way it spread into the United States. And as it turns out, on the ground in the United States, you see this shift from older gangs that were distributing gang d drugs um, to Cubans. And then in the 70s, when the Cuban thing, the, the conflict is between Colombians and Cubans, which has been dramatized in God knows how many movies, right? So that's the sense. Now, what would have, and of course, the other thing that, the, that Cuba does is it intensifies the Cold War everywhere. So with the intensification of the Cold War everywhere, there are all kinds of you know, effects that would happen that make politics throughout Latin America much more um, pro-US by elites, um, and that allow for the type of drug war policies that would later become hegemonic. Okay. They weren't really hegemonic. Nobody really knew that much about it in the early 60s. But by the 70s, they're being pushed. Uh, there's this excellent book by, um, what's his name, um, David Weimer, about um, the drug war as a modernization paradigm. And he kind of illustrates this confluence between the drug war, I think it's David Weimer, um, the drug war and the Cold War not just in Latin America, but other parts of the world. And I don't want to make that into an ideological issue, but I think on a practical level. So I don't think either of those two things would have happened. That doesn't, that begs the question is whether or not cocaine could have emerged as a big drug without the Cuban Revolution. It might have, you know, but Cuba was really the incubation point in the 50s and then creates that diaspora of traffickers in the 60s. Oh, my God, there's a lot of questions. I shouldn't spend so much time individually. I'll have to uh, give you a short answer. Well, I'll go from right to left here. I kind of wanted to follow up on this question. Uh, it seems like there's a missing link that might tie that together with the kickoff of the Colombian Civil War and with the, with the, uh, the Revolutionary Armed Forces coming into power there, uh, tying into the place with the, you know, with the Cuban Revolution. Uh, and I, I guess I'm asking whether there is a link between those two. Uh, you mean the FARC? The FARC and other guerrilla and paramilitary groups in the Colombian Civil War? No, I don't think so. I mean, the FARC is founded in 1964, but it has zero, nothing to do with drugs. There were no drugs in Colombia during that time. It has to do with a lot of, it has to do with the hardening of the Cold War in some sense. I just read a whole manuscript about that. Um, but drugs are not part of that picture. Later, by the 19, late 1980s, some of these Colombian guerrilla organizations, the M19, and then later the FARC, are getting involved in drugs, so-called narco-terrorism. And in the 1990s, it becomes a free-for-all in which hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake. And certainly, drugs create the conditions under which the FARC expanded greatly during the 1990s. Um, but the linking it to Cuba, I think, would be a bit of a, um, a stretch. Um, uh, the circumstances were quite, in some ways, quite particular to Colombia at that point. And this was before Colombia was involved with, with, with drugs. Colombia doesn't really get into drugs until about 1973 to 75. So it's a almost a decade later, and there's no evidence that leftists were involved in drugs until at least another decade more. Yes? Um, yeah, thanks so much. That, that was um, really cool, uh, useful information. Um, but I, I have a question about the concept of blowback. Yes. And I'm not sure I understand how you're using it. I mean, typically it's used to talk about Untended consequences of state policies that actually, in fact, harm the aggressor or harm the, the person who's yes. In, so I, I and I see, you know Brazil's an ally of the U.S. So obviously one could see that as blowback in some sense against the U.S. drug policy, right? Yeah. Or war drug. 
but so but so I wanted a little more specificity about that. But it really comes back to that larger question of the unintended consequences of the drug war. Yes. And that implies that sort of there's an intended consequence, right? And yes. and that the unintended is the accidental, is the it's the ignorance of causal mechanisms and or, or an inability to predict and so on. So it, in you, all of your uh, data uh, from this, these archives, what do you, what have you learned about what the, those intentions were and, and the degree to which that um, people were in fact surprised by X occurring as opposed to Y? That's a great question the, about the, what you see at the, at the archival level. Um, uh, because I once asked myself that, whether it would be possible to write a history of the drug war looking at the ways in which they were surprised at every turn by what happened. I mean, I, I, I do think, uh, first of all, at the beginning I did say that, you know, I do use it in a completely sloppy sense of I'm going to aggregate all these things and we're going to call it blowback. Uh, every unintended consequence, which people who study these things more rigorously, you know, they do a quantitative, uh, you know, thing on is there a balloon effect? Is there a price effect? Is there, you know, a, and there's all these quantitative studies out there. But I prefer the kind of big sloppy mess approach because, let me put it in context, is, um, just think about the term drug control. People use that seriously. Like, all these books came out in the 1980s. Drug control in the Americas, a new approach to drug control. Has this ever controlled drugs? So what I'm getting at is not some grand conspiracy theory. Other people love those conspiracy theories. Well, that's not what they're really after. The CIA is out to destabilize the revolution and out to make profits from the non-hemp industry. And I don't buy into any conspiracy theories whatsoever. But what I do buy into quite strongly is that drug policy is one of the most extraordinary areas of public policy where the unintended effects are so much bigger than the intended ones, that they, they neutralize them. And to speak of drug control, like even if you looked at the United States to speak of drug control would be absurd. But when you, when you project it to all these intangibles of an entire hemisphere and fighting in places you know nothing about, and it becomes a tragedy of unintended consequences. And they've just overwhelmed any sense. Just to look at the numbers, the amount of cocaine that they were trying to control at the very beginning mushrooms into something unimaginable. The amount of violence that maybe they cared about if, in the 80s mushrooms into something incalculable. So it, it, it's exactly the opposite of control. These unintended effects, if you kind of measure them, and even the UN has come to speak, they've changed their talk, and now they have a whole thing about the unintended social consequences of these policies. But I like to use the big historical map to show that it's, you know, beyond, it's worse than anybody ever imagined. It's not necessarily the same as a causality. It's not saying we caused all this to happen, though I suspect we did. Um, but is showing that these collateral and unintended consequences are far bigger than any gains that have ever been made. Um, and in any, almost any other area of public policy, there would be somebody who would come up with a calculator and say, I'm a policy wonk from Brown's Watson Institute, and I'm going to tell you that, um, that I don't actually know anything about Watson, so I don't know <laughs> if you have any of those. But uh, from the Kennedy School, let's go to your rival. And this drug war thing is all wrong. Uh, um, look at this from a cost-benefit perspective. Now, there's been dozens of these cost-benefit perspectives, and the drug war has failed every single one of them. But it just continued to go and go and go and go, which means that they're not interested in that. There's something else that's been driving it, at least until recently. Now we're beginning to see a sea change, that, at least in rhetoric, and we'll see if it goes deeper than that. But I don't know if that answers your question, but I have purposely looked for that big, big idea of thinking of this as 
blow back. Um, uh, so, I mean, you've answered. I, I just think it sounds like that, that's, that's an aspect of history that needs to be told of what, what were people desiring. Well, I, the, I think what they were desiring, in, that in, these in guys are cops, and that they, what they desire is not that complicated. They thought they'd be able to intervene and get rid of the drugs. And then they bought into it, and then it becomes institutionalized. But when they when they crack down in, in Chile, they thought there was not going to be any cocaine. When they go into Peru in the 1940s, they think that one or two operations, they're going to get rid of this stuff. When they go into Colombia, they realize, oh, this is more complicated than we thought, but we can win this if we just stick to it. There's this, like... And one other thing about it that, I mean, there are many aspects about it, but the one thing that they seem to lack, although they now have specialists now that add, maybe they've been trained at the Kennedy School, um, or whoever your rival is, uh, the, the, um, is that when you meet these people, what's striking about them, these people who design and implement these policies, is how myopic they are. They're always focused on one little thing. Could you, could you wipe out coca? in Southeast Colombia? Could it be done? And somebody like me goes, maybe, I don't know, but if you did, what would happen? <laughs> and they don't want to know that answer because it's not in their cubicle. There's nobody who has a global view of the impact. They're just trying to get this one little aspect of it done. So the globe maybe could be changed into a global view, you know, instead of the blowback view. But um, is that... It's shocking how myoptic they are in the implementation of policies. Yes, Matt. I mean, the, the move from the Caribbean to uh, Mexico is felt and discussed in exactly those terms in Mexico. That, in other words, we're suffering because they tried to push everything out of the Caribbean. They um, must have read Peter's book. There, exactly. Um, so I am going to ask a question that I hope doesn't sound like uh, asking you to give a talk that you didn't give, because I think it's really an extension on what you did. Uh, but I'm curious about consumption, and I'm curious about the relationship of the story you told to why there was more demand at certain times for certain things. And I'm thinking, in a way, of Sid Mintz and sugar. Yeah. In other words, you talk about the supply, you talk about it moving from one place to another, but you also talk about sales going up. Yeah. And there's not, it's not clear what the relationship of your story is to the sales going up and down. Yeah, I agree with you that, that I haven't been able to really, I mean, I give lip service to that. Of course, anybody can do that. But I really think other people really have to do a lot of the, the the groundwork of studying what happened with cocaine, its consumption, its cultural significance, its socioeconomic significance in the United States. I make a lot of generalities about it, but I haven't really researched it that much on the ground. And the one thing I do not want to give you the impression is that I believe that this is supply, like you just throw drugs in front of people and they take them. That's not really the way it works. That's the addiction paradigm and the you know, corruption of youth paradigm. And I don't think it really works that way. I think that there were also uh, long-term uh, uh, trends in the United States that contributed to the rise of a new knowledge and also desire for cocaine as a drug. For example, in the 1970s and 1980s, those of you who are into cultural studies, it's easier, easy to see that cocaine had a certain elective affinity with the kind of individualism and go-getter, you know, business, call it what you want, the Reagan years, you know, that, um, and also with the social conditions that were emerging in, in inner cities in the United States where structural unemployment, anybody who's read Philippe Bourgeois' work or any of that type of critical ethnography knows that um, cocaine filled a void in certain areas where there was no economy or other social paths um, by the late 80s left, right? So, you know, on the one hand, you have Papa Reagan telling you don't use any drugs. On the other hand, you have, it's political in this sense. 
um, uh, Reagan demolishing um, the vestiges of the welfare state, the industrialization, creating the social conditions that feed drugs like this. And meanwhile, the only point that I was making about the supply was that the price is striking. Whereas co cocaine went down, I don't have the numbers with me right here, but dramatically decreased in price from the early 70s all the way up when the first year where there was a de demonstrated rise in the price of cocaine on streets in the United States was 2007. So that's like, uh, my math is really bad, but I, I think that's like 40 years of bad drug policy. Because the whole purpose was to raise the price up so that people wouldn't be casually using this drug. And only after 2007 does that begin to happen. And they don't even understand why it begins to happen then. But I think that this could, could I've heard that there are people studying, historians studying crack. I've talked to a few of them. I wish I knew more about this. I mean, there are cultural trends that I think are very important in this. I see these early substitution effects quite quite strongly, that um, the, the early war on drugs, which some writers have actually lauded, like I don't know whether you've ever seen this book called The Fix by Michael Massinger, um, uh, which, which looks at the Nixon drug policy and says, this has been overlooked, look how social it was, methadone clinics, they were really on the right path, treatment. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is, again, myopia. Um, this time by a MacArthur Genius Award winner, um, which is he's only looking at a couple of years and those drugs, and he's not seeing that the unintended consequence was the explosion of cocaine, which was going to destabilize those same vulnerable populations in the United States within 10 years. So by focusing on certain drugs, they opened up the avenues for others. But I don't really, I agree with your critique about that. I wish I could be the Sydney Mintz of, of this, but I'm only half, maybe a little bit more. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Just a sec, my, my, my second question was, was, about, was Matt's question about kind of why do we see this, why do we see demand decreasing, right? Is it a lag? Is it the say no to drugs campaign lag? I don't know, right? What's what's driving um, finally the oh the today? Demand? Yeah, and I was interested. You didn't even mention math, so I was wondering kind of where kind of the shifting. So that's my second question. My first question though is, I was surprised you didn't talk more about the end of the Cold War. So kind of if to be kind of a little more, I think maybe Kathy was going this way, but to be a little more cynical, right? Sort of kind of push back against your idea of blowback. I think one narrative that I've heard is, so, right, Cold War ends, Southcom especially is looking for a justification for their increased funding, for their, or for their ongoing funding, and it's a war strategy. It's never intended to actually, maybe some low-level implementers are thinking we'll win, but it, it is a war strategy for ongoing funding, right? So I'm interested in kind of how much of this is a bureaucratic kind of politics story, um, and kind of if seen in that light, where does your blowback Story go and kind of and and what is that um, and what does that mean for today as well? Well, no, I understand what you're talking about, but what you're what you're talking about is really a delimited time period from 1989 to 2001, and during that period, the military were scrambling in the United States for new what they called it mission creep. But they didn't call it mission creep, but it was criticized as mission creep, and so justifying budgets, what are we fighting? Some of these ideologies of narco-terrorism emerged, we're fighting these same. But I don't think that advanced very far, and then on September 11, 2001, they no longer needed that. So that's not really what's, <laughs> what's at work anymore. I mean, they were able to utilize a little bit of that in terms of justifying the alliance with Colombia, because the FARC were terrorists, but nobody seriously believed that they were on the scale of Al-Qaeda, that they threatened the United States. There's never been any, any, um, anything to that. So, yeah, I think that there's been some of that, but I, but I also think that more, that they sincerely believe that this was something that they could show their muster and, and win and, 
and be good at or something like that. Um, but rather than bureaucratic politics, what I think, I mean, I understand what you mean by that. What I think has really been the long range problem is uh, more institutional politics in the sense that building up in the 80s and 90s, and anybody who's ever read that chapter in Michelle Alexander's book of, what's it called? The New Jim Crow, the one where the police departments start getting all these new toys, and and I forgot the name of the bill, but probably Peter remembers where you can and you, where you can seize assets. That's one of the big legacies of this period, um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the the new draconian drug laws and the kind of whole complex that emerges to disenfranchise and to jail um, inner city youth and whatnot. And why is that? that was she and other people might say well, it's ideologically driven. I actually think it's institutionally driven. You've got all these police departments and military branches and DEA and everything. They're all getting their budgets from this. They've got to believe that the, the drug war is what they're all tying themselves to. And even when they're getting cynical about whether or not this thing can actually be um, won, the institutional interests are just so ingrained. Now, that's different from bureaucratic politics, which is, hey, can we pretend that we're interested in this and get our Southcom budget and not close this base down there in Panama? The institutional weight these things have, the militarization of police forces, how long is it going to take the United States to back down from that now? Uh, the DEA. Who is going to come in and say, we should dismantle the DEA? Um, its militarized drug war vision is no longer effective. From a cost-benefit perspective, this does not work. These guys have institutional interests in continuing an obsolete strategy that nobody believes in anymore. But that's different from bureaucratic politics, which was probably at work in the early 90s when all these guys said, oh, I'm an expert on drugs now, not just, um, you know, counterinsurgency. I have a lot of questions here, Peter. You're going to have to yeah, give me... Um, four minutes to answer. Oh, no. I can do it. But, four questions. All right. I get... What you collect them? Okay, collecting questions. Okay. Um, do you think the left turn in Latin America has to do with this uh, visible autonomy of Latin America in, in the debate? And uh, if it is the case, what can we expect of this apparent new turn we are having again in Latin America, considering Evo Morales' defeat or Macri in Argentina? Okay, I answer your question quickly. No, I do not think the left turn is that significant in this. You know why? Because this is a strange mixture of left and right wing states. Colombia is not a left state, even under Santos, and yet it's the most outspoken. Guatemala was one of the most outspoken anti-US drug war states. Um, so part of it, yeah, is informed by um, left developments in Ecuador, but, but uh, Venezuela was never part of this anti-drug war coalition, quite the opposite. So it has very little to do with that. And that actually makes it more viable as an international movement, because it's not just the left, which may or may not be going out of fashion in Latin America. And it's, it's across the board. Collective. Oh, uh, yeah. Collective. I'm interested to know um, how much of this story you think is a very specific to cocaine. So how much of this is a very unique cocaine story, particularly the, particularly the latter half. Um, so, for example, you mentioned that law enforcement in the U.S. is more interested in heroin now than no. in cocaine. Um, so the implication of that would be, um, or the, the question that, that has an implication uh, tied to it is, if this really is just a specific cocaine story, then I would expect that if we're really worried about heroin, we would go to Afghanistan and just copy the same policies that we've done before, but with more vigor there. But if it's actually not a very specific cocaine story, then maybe our vision toward drugs in general is shifting a little bit, as you've implied it is for cocaine. Okay, quick answer is uh, 
the heroin thing is super interesting because uh, most of it's actually coming now from Mexico or from pharmaceuticals in the United States, you know, the OxyContin and, the, um, you know, these opioids. And so it's a mix of these two things. But the shift that's occurring may be part of this larger climate, but I, I'm going to give you a very simple answer of the type that I always decry. Um, <laughs> but heroin is really different this time. And why is it really different this time? Because the heroin users are white. And so suddenly they're, whoa, victims. Oh, they need help. They need therapy. They need no longer aggressive criminals. There's, I, I, we have not seen this in our lifetime. Not since marijuana was a white drug for a short time in the 70s, where it was just a big joke. And I think it's a positive development, but I can't help but be a little cynical about it. Like, why, for the first time, we're facing this kind of politics of compassion about hard drugs? We should, but it should be extended to uh, black and brown people as well. And the people who were unjustly jailed in the 1990s um, under completely unfair drug laws should be freed, um, along with drug treatment for all these people. But it's a so it's a it's a mixture of things. But it's um, I don't think anybody except the Russians are saying we should go into, and the Russians are saying that they should go into Afghanistan and smash down the um, opiate fields, but. It ain't going to work. And the United States is no longer involved. You know, the United States doesn't support that because we would lose our last defense against the Taliban. And worse, ISIS now. Yeah. So I just have one question about the Taliban. Um, you know, the well, two questions. Why leave out Bolivia so much in, in kind of your discussion? And the second one, doesn't it have to do kind of with, as I read your work, distinct political histories between these Indian his countries, right? I mean, that Peru it has a quite distinct 20th century political history than Bolivia, as does Colombia, and as you took a 20th century approach, and I, I know it's 530, but that these two account for these different re state responses. Like why Peru now has no military to respond, and okay. Bolivia is completely outside of this narrative. Do you have a card or something? Can <laughs> yeah, I yeah. Because I just finished yeah. writing a like 50-page paper Great. that deals with precisely what you just did. I look at the why these three Andean states have these yeah. incredibly diverse responses, and I try to link it to um, long histories, surprising histories with the drugs, and to try to understand the diversity between Peru, Bolivia, and Colombia. And if you give me your yeah. card, I'll send you a copy of this paper that I just slaved over <laughs> over my winter break, which is precisely, you know, you knew what the problem is there. Precisely the big, people talk about drug reform movement, but I'm trying to see it more as the diversification that's going on. As sovereignties are increasing, as they are in most cases of Latin America, suddenly these, Colombia has a different response than Bolivia has. Um, I didn't mean to believe, leave Bolivia out of the story. It's a different story. Um, and Peru is sort of kind of lost in the middle of this. But I've written an entire paper that's trying to take a stab at that precise problem in the context of the changing commodity chain. So if you want, I can send you that uh, paper. But I agree. We are over time. Oh, uh, all right. Get you I'll take overtime, Pay. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry.